You can turn in your Bible to Acts chapter 17. I'm going to do a study, a more detailed study, on the Godhead in the King James Bible, as opposed to the Roman Catholic Trinity concept. And um, I'm going to look at all the references to Godhead. And of course, if you try to find any references to the word Trinity in the King James Bible, you're going to come up empty-handed. There are no references to the word Trinity. Uh, I think that we really should stick with biblical terms and wording. Um, I personally have used the word Trinity in reference to the Godhead, but uh, it's become very clear to me um, and since all this stuff, you know, all the fighting back and forth has come out over this thing of this uh, modalism or Trinity or all these other things and words and things like this. It's become very clear to me um, the importance of sticking with what the Bible teaches about the Godhead. And a lot of these scriptures I've gone over in other videos, um, but I've had people say, okay, could you please come out and do an, an actual thing? What do you believe about the Godhead versus the Trinity? So that's what this study is going to be. So we're going to look at the three references, interesting number, to the word Godhead in the King James Bible. Here's the first one, Acts chapter 17, verse 29 to verse 30. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, remember that little statement, that'll be important, we ought not to think that the God has, Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. There were many, many times in, in the past, throughout history, people did not understand the Godhead. Okay, that's what's going on here in Acts chapter 17. Paul is speaking to pagan people, the Athenians, and they had this altar up there in verse 23, this altar with the this inscription to the unknown God. All right, and Paul is saying, I'm going to declare him unto you. I'm going to you know tell you about you know who God is, and he preaches to them Jesus. Okay, um, and I'm going to tell you right now, my belief is that I believe that the Godhead is bodily in one man. You know, the fullness of the Godhead dwells in one man. All right, and Jesus is the body, God the Father is the soul, and the Holy Ghost is the spirit of that one being. All right, now we're going to get into a lot more details on this thing, but I said to you to remember the key wording here in verse 29. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, what does our creation and the offspring of us being created by God, what does that have to do with this thing of the Godhead? Well, go to Luke chapter 3, verse 38. If you go back in time to the very first man, <clears throat> what was his name? The man that first, first man that was created, I'll say it that way. Adam. Who was Adam's father? Who created Adam? Luke chapter 3, verse 38, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. Adam is God's created son. Jesus Christ is God's only begotten son. John chapter 3, verse 16. Of course, the infamous John 3, 16. God had two sons. One begotten, born of him, one created. How was Adam the created son? How was he formed? For as much then as we are the offspring of God, then Paul goes into talking about the Godhead. Go back to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 through 27. We're going to see how God created man. Genesis 1.26 says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over, over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created, created he them. All right? We are made in God's image. What is the image of God? Well, we'll be talking about that throughout this study, but I'm going to just, I'll break it down for you again. Here, I already mentioned it, body, soul, spirit. There's three 
in one. Right now, there are, you are not seeing three of me. You're seeing one, and yet there's three. So how's that possible? I have a body, I have a soul, and I have a spirit. Can any of you out there accurately draw what my soul and my spirit looks like? No, you can't. Why then would you think that you could do the same with the Lord? You can draw his body, you know, people de you know, draw depictions of Jesus Christ all the time, but what does the soul and the spirit look like? See, that's where the Catholics go wrong. They think that they're smart enough to be able to draw that. I mean, obviously, Jesus was a man. He was here. He blended in with people and things like this. Uh, he looked like a man. You could draw some kind of an artist's rendition of Jesus Christ, certainly. But how are you going to draw God the soul and the Holy Ghost the spirit. We're going to talk more about that as we continue. But notice something very interesting here in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26. Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion. Then list all these different animals, fish, birds, you know, all that stuff. Why should man have dominion over the natural world? And what separates us from the animal kingdom? We'll say, what separates us? We are made in God's image. They're not. Animals don't have three parts. They don't have, they have a body. And uh, trying to think here, Ecclesiastes, let me look up a verse real quick here. Uh, I can't, I can always forget if it's that they have a soul and not a spirit or a spirit and not a soul. Uh, Ecclesiastes, you could actually turn there. So you can see, okay, <clears throat> yes, yeah, spirit. Um, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 19 through 21, we'll just read this. For that, that which befalleth the sons of men befalleth beasts, even one thing befalleth them, as the one dieth, so dieth the other. Yea, they have all one breath, so that a man hath no preeminence above a beast, for all is vanity. All go unto one place, and all are the dust, all are of the dust. And I'll turn to dust again. We'll talk about that here in just a little bit too. Um, verse 21. Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth? So an animal has a spirit in them. They breathe. Okay. When their breath stops, they're not living anymore. And then they start the process of turning into soil, into dirt again. Okay. Um, man's the same way. But the thing that def differentiates between man and beast is a beast is a dualinity, <laughs> you know, so to speak. It's um, I shouldn't even use the term trinity, but <laughs> you see what I'm saying? You know, a beast is two, body, spirit. A man is three, body, soul, spirit. That's the difference. That's why we are given dominion over the animal kingdom out there. We're made in God's image. Look at uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. There you see it. What do we have? God formed man of the dust of the ground. Your body, your flesh, is composed of many of the same elements as dirt. That's why when you die, you turn back into dirt like we read in, over in Ecclesiastes. Your body is essentially made out of dirt. All right? Um, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. There's the spirit. And man became a living soul. Three in one. Go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I'll show you the New Testament tie-in here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Let me get to it here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, before we continue, let me give you the whole uh, crux of the matter here, okay? The whole, if you want to just sum it all up. Those that believe the biblical Godhead say 
that it's Father as the soul, Holy Ghost as the spirit, and Jesus as the body. Three in one. That's why the Bible says that we are made in the image of God. The Trinity people believe, no, there is God, the Father, and he has his own body, soul, and spirit. The Holy Ghost has his own body, soul, and spirit, and Jesus Christ has his own body, soul, and spirit. And they come together in oneness. They're not actually one as far as one being walking around. No, no, it's three separate beings, but one in purpose. And what you're going to find is when you look at this whole study, Godhead versus Trinity, Catholic Trinity, what you're going to find is the people that defend the Catholic Trinity have to invent all kinds of words that do not appear in the King James Bible to prove their case. They'll say, um, these three are one. What's well, it's not so much one, it's more oneness, one in in purpose and 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 and, and <laughs> Or they'll say divine essence. When Jesus you know, is referred to as God the Father or whatever their scriptures and things, well, that's the divine essence that's upon him. Or they'll say, you know, the very word Trinity is not a Bible word. They'll come up with all these things, all these terms and, and things, and we're going to see where it comes from here in a couple minutes. They come up with all this different stuff to try and prove that the Trinity is the correct teaching. But when you actually look at the King James Bible, you go, wait a second, this Trinity, Catholic Trinity thing is false. It's just blatantly false. Again, if God is up there in heaven and he's got a body, soul, and spirit, and Jesus has a body, soul, and spirit, and the Holy Ghost has a body, soul, and spirit, well, you know, I guess you could technically make the argument that Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, where he says, let us make man in our image, you could say, well, you know, uh, well, you know, it's just made in one of the images of one of the persons of the Godhead or something like this. But again, it's just a weird system, very, very weird system. But, you know, then it contradicts other scriptures, too, if you take that stand, which we're going to be talking about that. Let's go to the second time that the word Godhead appears. Romans chapter 1. First one is Acts chapter 17. Second one will be in Romans chapter 1. Verse 20 through 23. And here's where you really get the, these Trinity people, where you can really nail them to the wall. Verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Wait for one minute there. Okay, what did we read earlier? Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 2, the creation of the world. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world. Were you there to see the creation of the world? No. Was I there? No. Well then, uh, what's this verse saying? The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. What are those things that are made? You say nature and creation. Well, that's true. But look more specifically at what's going on here. If even his eternal power and Godhead, for as much then as we are the offspring of God. First time Godhead shows up in Acts chapter 17, takes you back to the creation, where God says, let us make man in our image. Hmm. So that they are without excuse. Who's the they? In Romans chapter 1, verse 20. Who's the they? People. Do you think animals need to make excuses? No. Who's What's going on here? What it's saying is, dear friend out there, saved or if you're, you know, if you're saved, you're a brother or sister in Christ. If you're lost, well, I'll call you, you know, dear friend, because you need to, you know, think about this stuff. What the Bible is saying here is, you are made in the image of God. God cared enough about you to make you in His image. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are not some mistake or whatever else. If you are living right now and you're breathing and everything else, you were not put here by mistake. They might tell you, you know, oh, well, you were a mistake and things like this and there was fornication or there was some kind of a whatever else and you were a mistake or your parents really didn't plan you or whatever. Uh, 
if God doesn't want you created, you're not going to be created. Everybody that's on this earth was put here for a purpose. And that purpose is ultimately to find God and to get saved. All right? But you can't say, well, I don't, I don't see any proof of God. You, yourself, your created body that's amazing, that has a body, soul, and spirit, right there is the proof. You see these people, they say, I don't understand the concept of the Trinity and whatever else. Well, the Trinity is a, is a false pagan concept. But the Godhead? No. Body, soul, spirit. And man is made in that image. You have a body, you have a soul, and you have a spirit. And your soul and your spirit lives on. Your body will be changed in eternity. Um, and that's a whole other study. Not going to get into the big thing on that right now. But the point is, you are an eternal creature. Nobody out there, no man, woman, whatever, child, none of you are going to just die and just be gone. That's what animals do. You're not an animal. You have preeminence above animals. Very important to understand that. Verse 21, Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. What happens when their foolish heart is darkened? Verse 22, Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. These people that try to figure out the Godhead and try to make it into all this pagan false idol stuff like the Trinity, the Catholic Trinity. And here's where I got you. If you believe in this pagan Trinity thing, here's where I got you. Okay? Because, see, the pagan Trinity of Roman Catholicism has Jesus sitting here, you know, the little guy with the nice little hand thing, and God the Father over here is the old grandpa-looking guy with a big white beard, and then the Holy Spirit's a little bird up above. Because each one has to have a body, soul, spirit, body, soul, spirit, body, soul, spirit, right? It can't be three in one. No, it's just three in, you know, three separate in one in unity. <laughs> but check this out. Verse 23. And change the glory of the uncorruptible God. Listen. Into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Hmm. I find that to be very interesting because that's exactly what the Trinity people do. They change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and birds. How about that? The little white dove, the little flying white dove and stuff. And I realize the Holy Spirit showed up as a dove in Scripture and things when Jesus was being baptized. I understand that. But that's not his normal, you know, he's not up in heaven. You know, there's a little bird up in heaven sitting there right now. I mean, show me that in Scripture. You know, he appears one time like that on the earth and people go, that's the way he always looks, you know, apparently, I guess. Weird. But I find that to be very interesting. That condemns this whole pagan Catholic Trinity thing right there. Romans chapter 1, verse 23. Change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man. That's what the Trinity concept is. The Catholics have their paintings. They have even have their statues and things like that. I've showed those in other studies. And people go, that's the Trinity right there. Pretty incredible stuff. But think about it from the Bible, what the Bible teaches about the Godhead. Body, soul, spirit. Can you make an image of a soul or a spirit? No, you can't. And that's why there's a prohibition in Scripture saying, don't make a graven image of the Godhead. You're not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver, you know, or stone, uh, graven by art and man's device. Acts chapter 17, verse 29. You're not supposed to think of it that way. Why? Because you can't understand it. You know? But see, these people, oh, I'm, I'm so wise. We're theologians and things like this, and our official church teaching on the Trinity is whatever. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Hmm. Let's go to the next one. Colossians chapter 2. Here's the final reference to... Uh, the Godhead, uh, Acts chapter 17, Romans chapter 1, 
Colossians chapter 2. Let's look at this one. And remember what we just read in Romans chapter 1. You'll find Scripture ties in so perfectly when you go through it and things, and the Lord shows you this stuff. Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Remember, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and birds. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy, man's wisdom. In other words, and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. They're giving you a false interpretation of what Jesus Christ is, this whole Trinity concept. Now look at verse 9. Final reference to the word Godhead. For in him, who's the him? Verse 8, Christ. For in him dwell, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Everything that the Godhead is, all the fullness of the Godhead dwells in one man bodily. Now what are you going to do with that if you're one of these Trinity people? And I realize they'll get all philosophical and they'll try to explain it away and things like this. Again, what you're going to find out as a Christian in your life as a Christian is there are some people that literally cannot accept the truth. Number one, they're lost. Okay, They can't truly understand things. But even lost people, I've seen lost people that have better understanding of certain concepts and are more open to hearing truth than people that profess to be saved. Um, truth is something that comes by revelation, certainly, but there are just simple basic things in Scripture that even lost people can get many times. And they can say, yeah, it, it, that is interesting. I never heard that before, whatever else. But you get somebody that's truly... Uh, you know, preaching a false gospel and has all kinds of false beliefs and things and in their pride, they profess themselves to be wise and they actually they're fools. They're getting, they get into philosophy and traditions of men and things like this. Um, you know, you're not going to be able to convince these people. And they'll just twist and twist and twist the scriptures. And that's why the Bible says a man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition, reject. Now, you know, I'm a Bible teacher. I preach the Word of God, and I say um, there are certain people that I will use them more than two times to show what false doctrine is. Stephen Anderson is probably the best example of that. There's others that I've rebuked as well more than two times. You know, they're heretics, and I rebuke them multiple times, but I'm rebuking them to teach people how to spot false prophets, number one. Number two, about how to debunk false teachings. So... But, you know, there's really no way to get around this thing if you're honest. I mean, in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Right there it is. You can't get around that thing. Unless you try to philosophize it and, and get in there. Well, when it, when it says in him uh, and all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, well, that's talking about the divine essence what God's purpose, his, his, um, uh, and they'll get all philosophical. Just read it and believe it. That's what Bible believing Christians do. But let's look over here in Colossians chapter 1, verse 12. We'll read down to verse 20. I'll show you a little bit more here on this. Colossians chapter 1, verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. So we went from God the Father to Jesus Christ, the Son. And again, you know, there's no contradiction there. How can Jesus be the Father and the Son at the same time? Very simple. The Son is the body. The Father is the soul. Simple. And I've talked about this in other studies. The body and the soul can separate. Okay? And uniquely so with God. That's why you get up to heaven and you can see the body sitting here and the soul sitting over there. You say, can you draw that out? Absolutely not. I don't understand all that stuff. You know, I mean, if I could understand everything about the Godhead, then that proves that, you know, whoever the Godhead is doesn't have any more sense or any more power than I have. And that would certainly not be the kind of a God that I'd be willing to worship. But let's continue here. Verse 14. 
Colossians 1.14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Unless you use an NIV, they took out through his blood. I just had to throw that in there. Verse 15. Again, here we see it. Compare this with Colossians 2.9. Verse 15. Talking about Jesus again here. In context, we're talking about Jesus. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Wait a second. If up in heaven, this trinity is... Jesus, body, soul, spirit, he has his own body, soul, and spirit. God the Father, body, soul, and spirit. The Holy Ghost, body, soul, and spirit. How could you call him the invisible God? Hmm. No, you see, it's not that way. The reason God is invisible is because he is the soul within the body of Jesus Christ. Verse 16. For by him, Jesus, again in context here, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Jesus has the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. If you compare Colossians 1.20, about the blood of his cross there, to Acts chapter 20, verse 28, you'll see that it says about feeding the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. And again, the Trinitarian will have to come around and they'll say, yes, but that's God the Son. And then they come up with their little three God teaching. God the Son, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit. You know? And it's like, uh, could you give me some scripture on that, please? Where has Jesus ever called God the Son? He's not. It's amazing how much the Trinity people have to invent things that don't appear in scripture. Those of us that believe in the biblical Godhead, we don't have to invent any kind of language to explain what the Bible teaches about Jesus Christ and the Godhead. I don't have to invent any kind of words. But let's go to John chapter 14. Right from the mouth of Jesus Christ, and every single one of these Trinity people will come along and just look at this, and they'll say, Jesus lied. Or he didn't mean, you're taking it out of context or blah, blah, blah. They will accuse Jesus of lying. Maybe not outright, but of course in their twisting of the scriptures to try and make Jesus say something that he didn't say. I mean, Jesus just comes right out and says, you know, what's going on here with the Godhead. And they'll twist it. These Trinity people, I've seen it time and time again. John chapter 14, verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, uh, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Verse 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Again, notice the three parts there. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Okay, what's the way? Well, Jesus is the way into heaven. He's the door. Read about that in John chapter 10. What's the truth? All right? Uh, the spirit of truth, when, he's, when the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. That's the Holy Spirit. Or the Holy Ghost, whichever one you want to say there. The life. God breathes into Adam's nostrils and you know, the breath of life, and he becomes a living soul. Okay? Interesting. But look at what Jesus says here in verse 7. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also, and from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Wait a second. Um, I thought the Bible said that, that, uh, the, that God is invisible. Another part of Scripture says, No man hath seen God at any time. Why would Jesus say, Ye have seen him? Oh, well, that you see, that's Jesus is talking about the divine 
essence there, the, the, the unity that he has with God the Father, being him, God the Son. And See, that's what these heretical Trinitarians will do. They'll come out and they'll say, well, there's this divine essence, or it's oneness, it's oneness and purpose, and they've got to create all these words. You say, could you give me a scripture that says that? You know, no, they can't. Just believe what it's saying here. It's a lot easier, a lot more honest, too. From henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Now look at what happens here. Verse 8, Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? Who is he referring to? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father, and how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. His Father is in him, the soul. And I saw somebody in one of the comments said, well, if God the Father is the soul and Jesus is the body, then they can't be both the same. Oh, please, please. Yes, they are the same. Jesus is saying that. He didn't say, he that hath seen me hath seen the body and the Father is the soul. He's, no, he's saying, it's all in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Again, comparing scripture with scripture. If you've seen Jesus Christ, you've seen the Father. Okay? Again, understand that. If you are a Christian, you can just look and say, well, that's what the Bible says. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. God the Father and Jesus Christ, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, the Spirit. Body, soul, spirit. Okay, I get it. Can you draw it out for me? No, I can't draw that thing out. Can you explain it and everything about how it all works? No. Why? God's greater than I am. There are certain things in eternity that, that we'll understand that we can't get right now. I don't know what my soul looks like. I don't know what my spirit looks like. I've never seen them. But I know I have a soul and a spirit in me. You see? I mean, if I if you said, you know, hey, show me your soul, I'd say, well, he that hath seen me hath seen my soul. That's what's going on there. John chapter 1. I mean, you could, you know, this is one of them subjects that you could get, just go over every single scripture. But, you know, like I said, I've seen this thing. If you can't convince somebody after showing them clear scriptures like this, you're just wasting your time. And as time goes by more and more, um, again, I've seen things where, you know, I've seen brethren, they'll bring stuff out or the Lord will bring something out, you know, through me. And and uh, and it's just like, I mean, this whole Trinity versus Godhead thing, it was just kind of an innocent thing. I said, you know, I believe Jesus is God the Father. And, and it was just like, pff, everything blew up. And I'm going, okay, you know. And it just has gotten more and more and more. But something will come out and it kind of gets hashed out between the brethren and kind of goes, you know, back and forth and people give arguments and counter arguments and whatever else. And it's like Christians take sides. And I know a lot of you have written me and you've just been like, I don't understand how these Trinity people can't get it. It's just right there. It's just plain, you know. No. Saved versus lost, brethren. John chapter 1, verse 1. Let's read these verses. And the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, how does that work out if you have three separate persons up there? In the beginning was the Word, okay? There's the one separate one. And the Word was with God. Okay, again, we see Word here, God here. And the Word was God. Oh, um, you say, well, that just means Jesus is the Word. We know that. That's true. So that's Jesus is as God the Son, you see. Oh, that does not, that's not what it says there, all right? It's saying the Word was God. And again, how would it make any sense in context to say, well, it's just talking about Jesus being God the Son. Well, then why does it say the Word was with God? And the Word was God. See, it doesn't make any sense. These, these Trinitarian people are just so, just they're not logical. They don't think these things out. You can't be 
with God and, you know, God over here or something. It, it's just messed up. Jesus is the Word. He was there in the beginning, and He is God. Simple. And again, you know, please give me one scripture where Jesus says, I'm not God the Father, or where He's called God the Son. Just one scripture. Verse 2, The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Compare that to Colossians chapter 1. And without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Trinity people. <laughs> there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Okay, just got to stop right there and just kick another little, this whole devil-worshipping movement of this replacement theology thing. They say, the Bible doesn't say that Jesus was a Jew. Jesus wasn't a Jew. Well, he came to his own, didn't he? Who's his own? Saved Christians? <laughs> and they received him not? You know, duh, no. When Jesus came to his own, he came to the Jewish people, and they didn't receive him. But they will in the future. Read Romans chapter 11. But uh, let's continue here. Verse 12. Excuse me. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He's not a created son. He's the begotten son of God. All right. Verse 15, John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake, he that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Okay. No man seen God at any time. Then why over in John 14 does it say, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. So you've got to call Jesus a liar at some point in time if you're a Trinity person. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. First Timothy 3.16 says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Okay? Again, the biblical Godhead is a mystery. You can't understand me. Draw a soul and a spirit. You can't. We have no idea. We have no, no idea how to draw a soul and a spirit. But the Catholic Trinity... Sure, you can absolutely draw that. Now, I've asked these Trinity people, I've said, is the Catholic Trinity, Jesus, God, and the little dove, is that an accurate depiction of what it looks like? Maybe not the exact details, but is that basically the, the look? And they'll say, yeah, absolutely. Totally in violation of Romans chapter 1, where it says that you're not to think that the Godhead is, you know, uh, like to corruptible man or to birds, and yet they just totally violate it. You're not to make a graven image. And yet they do. See, well, it's just about uh, bowing down and worshiping to it. That's not what the Bible says there. Weird. 1 John chapter 5. <clears throat> the infamous Johannine Kama. It wasn't in the original autographs and all the other stuff. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> and they'll say, well, Erasmus, you know, took it out and put it in and put it in and took it out and all, you know, put it in, turn it out, turn it into sauerkraut or something like that. You know, the the whole Johannine comma thing, you can get into all that stuff. First John 5, 7, should it be in there? Was it in the oldest manuscripts? And, you know, they'll say, well, there was only a few late manuscripts that had it. And then you show actually another you know, early church father citations 
uh, and there was, you know, other manuscripts and things there. Well, yeah, but, you know, there's so much lying about the passage. But if you actually look at the context of it, it doesn't make any sense. Verse 8 doesn't make any sense without verse 7. So, yes, it's supposed to be in there. Whole other study. But let's look at 1 John 5, 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. I mean, again, it's just right there. They'll say, what, but that means one in purpose. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say that. What's oneness? It doesn't say that. Three are one. In him dwelleth all the uh, fullness of the Godhead bodily. That's how the thing works. <clears throat> Look at uh, verse 20 and 21. First John chapter 5, verses 20 and 21. And we know that the Son of God is come and hath given us an understanding, unless you're lost, that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. So if there are three gods, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, does that mean that the only true God is Jesus? It's what our text says. This is the true God. So God the Father, God the Holy Ghost are false gods? No. There's only one God, and he is composed of three parts. Body, soul, spirit. Man is made in the image of God with a body, soul, spirit. Do you understand? Well, if you don't, well, there's, you know, you might want to check and see if you're saved. Okay, if you're brand new to this whole thing, you might be a little bit confused on it or whatever and have to do a little bit more studying and praying about it. Go ahead. Look up the scriptures. Read them for yourself. Pray about it. But it's crystal clear to you if you're saved and you've been in the Bible a little bit. I mean, this is the true God and eternal life. Talking about Jesus Christ. He's the true God. Well, if you believe in the Catholic Trinity, then that's excluding God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. If you believe that way. Here's a good little bit of advice for you if you're a Trinity person or falling for some of this Trinity heresy. Verse 21, little children, keep yourselves from Catholic Trinity. <coughs> Excuse me, idols. Idols. I meant to say idols. Amen. Yeah, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. And again, this is a classic text that you can go to to, to disprove these wingnut Catholic Trinity people. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Talking about Jesus Christ, has to be. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And these, I've seen these Trinity people now come up with all kinds of weird philosophical stuff. Well, the Everlasting Father in context is about the father of the Jewish nation. So um, it's talking not about that he's God, uh, the Father. It's talking about in divine essence that he's... It's not what it's saying, okay? It's plainly teaching that Jesus Christ is called these titles here. The mighty God, the everlasting Father. Jesus Christ is the true God. God manifest in the flesh, you know. But we'll go over three common attacks that you're going to hear on the Godhead, the biblical Godhead, and in promotion of the papal uh, trinity. Um, number one, you'll say, how can Jesus be the Father and the Son at the same time? Talked about that a little bit earlier. Well, go to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. And again, I've talked about this in my other video and things, one of the videos I did. So I've already brought this out, but, you know, we'll go over it again. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. But God, who is rich in mercy for his love, great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. 
You say, well, that's talking about the, re the resurrection and stuff. No, it's talking present tense. Hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That hasn't happened. If you're, if you're saying, well, that's the resurrection and things like that, then why is Paul talking in the present tense? No, the fact of the matter is, we are part of the body of Christ right now as a Christian. And as I've said, how does this thing even work? How is it that our soul can be here and spirit and things in our body, and yet we're sitting together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus? Well, again, the similar kind of thing there where you have Jesus on the earth and he's praying to God in heaven. The soul is somehow up there, but yet he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. Explain it to me. I can't. I don't understand that. The just shall live by faith. I have to have faith and say, well, the Bible says it. I believe it. Just as simple as that. But again, if you're trying to say, you know, show me some scriptures where the soul and the body can be separated. I just did. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6 in particular. And again, you have Revelation chapter 6. We'll go there real quick. Show you another one. Revelation chapter 6. Um, verse 9, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said that unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled." souls in heaven john sees them and white robes are given to him so you get god the father on the throne and jesus christ down there as the lamb of god it can happen explain it i can't draw us a picture i can't make an animated movie or something but i can't I mean, you can kind of try to get a concept of a thing or whatever, like the Jack Chick comics. You know, he'll try to, he tried to draw the thing out and stuff like this, and he just kind of shows this light being, and there's, his face is just kind of smooth, and he's got a kind of white robe on and things like that. Well, that's an artist's rendition, you know. And I think you really need to be careful with some of that stuff, but uh, nobody really knows what it looks like. It's down here, anyhow. Uh, problem number two that the uh, Trinitarians will come up with. They'll say, how can Jesus be seated at the right hand of God the Father? Okay, and I saw one of you put this in the comments. I thought this was pretty good. Isaiah chapter 46. Isaiah chapter 46, verse 17 through 25. It says here, um, okay, I have that written wrong. It's Isaiah 45. The Bible gets me so many times because up here at the top of the page it says Isaiah 46. You know, you can see it right there like that. So it's actually, but 46 doesn't start till over here. And I'm looking over there. So Isaiah 45, excuse me. Isaiah 45, verse 17. But Israel shall be saved in the Lord with an everlasting salvation. Ye shall not be ashamed nor confounded with world without end. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens. What do we read in Colossians chapter 1? Jesus created the heavens. God himself that formed the earth and made it. Jesus is called God yet again. He hath established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I seek, or I said not, unto the seed of Jacob. Seek ye me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. Assemble yourselves and come. Draw near together. Ye that are escaped of the nations, they have no knowledge that set up the wood of their graven image and pray unto a God that cannot save. The Trinity God of Catholicism can't save you. It's a false God. Tell ye, and bring them near, yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? 
and there is no God else beside me, a just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. Now, you know, you can take that and say, well, God is the only God and things. And, you know, and, and uh, I saw, it was so funny, I saw here recently that uh, Stephen Anderson came out with a thing about Isaiah 9, 6, and he's like, well, see, in the Old Testament, it was talking about God as being declared as one God, but things weren't revealed until the New Testament. And I'm going, you know, about the Trinity. And he's like, the Trinity's all through the New Testament. It's all through there. You know, and I'm going, wait a second. So you're saying that there were things in the Old Testament which weren't revealed until the New Testament. That's dispensational teaching. Maybe not going the whole way to correct dispensational, but he teaches the gospel is Genesis to Revelation. And yet there are things that are not there yet and they are later revealed and things. No, there's no uh, revelation stuff that's happening as far as what's going on here. All right, or Isaiah 9, verse 6, either. But I just thought that was kind of funny. But um, look what it says there. There's none beside me. There's no God there. There's, uh, there's no God else beside me. Now, if Jesus Christ is sitting on a throne here, and God the Father is sitting on a throne over there, and the Holy Spirit's just kind of in a perpetual levitating pattern there, you know, flying above him and shooting down his little sun rays or whatever on him, um, if that's the, you know, Trinity that you worship, well, then God couldn't say there's no God beside me because right over there, or to his right hand, I guess, right over here to his right hand is Jesus, who's God the Son. So there's not just one God, there's three of them. So if God the Father said, there's none, there's no God beside me, and you say, well, it's not talking about directly seated beside but there would be more than one God, wouldn't there? So he could say, he couldn't say, you know, not just the, the literal thing of there's no God sitting beside me, but also there's no God other than me. You know, see how this thing gets you all messed up? If there are three gods, then God can't say there's no God beside me. If you want to take it literal, and he says there's no God literally beside me, how does that work out if Jesus is sit, seated at his right hand? Verse 22, Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else. Jesus is the only name, you know, among men, you know, given under heaven among men, whereby, you know, we must be saved. Verse 23, I have sworn by myself, the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness, and shall not return, that unto me... Every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall swear. Surely shall one say, And the Lord have I righteousness and strength. Even to him shall men come, and all that are incensed against him shall be ashamed. And the Lord shall all the seed of Israel be justified, and shall glory. Now compare those scriptures with the New Testament, what it says about Jesus Christ. At the name of Jesus, every knee is going to bow. Lines up with verse 23. And the Jews are going to accept Jesus as their Messiah one day. Mark chapter 13. Go here. The final argument against the biblical Godhead that they'll try to bring up uh, is they'll say, why didn't Jesus understand things on earth that God in heaven knew? Mark chapter 13. This is the passage here that they're referring to. Verse 32 and 33. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, know not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father, Take ye heed, watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. Okay, so they'll say, see, Jesus couldn't be God the Father, because if he was God the Father, he would have known. Um, yeah, but they seem to forget the, the basic thing there. Jesus Christ is on the earth, and there are things that he's fulfilling and carrying out and stuff like that, but the Jews at that point in time had not rejected him completely as their Messiah. So he's saying, I'm not, you know, in up there outside of time. You know, God the Father there is outside of time. And there are certain things he's keeping hidden from Jesus Christ. Okay, just the same way right now. Again, go back to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. We're seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus right now. So there's part of you, when the Bible says you're given eternal life, it really truly means that. Your soul and your spirit are up there in heaven. Your soul and your spirit know when the rapture is. Do you? 
No. I mean, that passage right there, Mark 13. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Does the Father know the hour? The second coming in passage there, Mark 13, talking about the second coming. Does the Heavenly Father, does our Heavenly Father, does He know about the second coming, the day and the hour? Yep. Does Jesus? Well, He's up in heaven right now. So yeah. Does your soul and spirit, seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus? Yes. Do you? No. You don't. No matter what some people seem to think, you don't know the timing of the second coming. As far as the day and the hour is talking about, I mean, we can see it rapidly approaching the time of Jacob's trouble, and we know catching away the bride of Christ comes before that. But we don't know the day or the hour of either event, second coming or the rapture. So uh, there's tons more scriptures we could go over. Um, but again, understand what the importance of this Catholic Trinity thing is to them. And, you know, I have a video on it. You can watch the video. The Roman Catholics have two trinities that they believe in. They believe in a heavenly trinity and an earthly trinity. Okay? The heavenly trinity is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. That's what they believe. Their little pagan diagram thing that they put up. And I brought out the thing on that symbol, you know, where it has, you know, God in the middle and then the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, however that thing works out. And then they have, you know, a little line going between the two. It looks like the Kabbalah, the Kabbalistic magic thing. And, and it has the little, on the little line it says, is not. So you have, Jesus is not the Father. The Father is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not Jesus. Like this. And Steve Anderson openly came out, put the symbol up on his channel, and defends it. Straight out of Roman Catholicism. Defends the thing. I've been warning about this guy for years. I'm telling you, he is a he is a Judas Iscariot. He is a betrayer. He's trying to turn the world against Bible-believing Christians. And he's doing a pretty good job of it, too, I might add. And that's why I will continue to oppose the guy. All right? But uh, this whole thing of this Catholic Trinity, that's their heavenly Trinity. The earthly Trinity is Joseph, Mary, Jesus. You put the two together, you get the hexagram. And again, you know, I did a whole study on that. Who really owns Israel? Well, they put their hexagram on it. Uh, what was the thing of Hitler, the Roman Catholic Adolf Hitler, putting hexagrams on the Jews, taking them off to the extermination camps to wipe them out? It's going to happen again. All right. And of course, when you read the book of Revelation, you'll see that there's another three uh, beings that are going to be here on the earth. Another trinity. Satan, the false prophet, and the Antichrist, the beast. They're going to be three distinct people in the future that are going to be there for people to worship. They're going to see it as the Trinity, very different from the biblical Godhead. The biblical Godhead is something you're not to make a graven image because you can't. We can't understand what the biblical Godhead looked like because we have not seen, you can't depict a soul, you can't depict a spirit. So, uh, you know, you're going to have to make a decision. If you're a Bible-believing Christian, you have to go with what the Bible says. If you want to go with what the Trinity says, then you've got to go with all the invented philosophical language of all those that try to prove this Trinity thing. Divine essence, oneness, Trinity itself, all these other terms that they come up with. You can't just stick solely to the King James Bible like those of us that believe in the biblical Godhead can. You're going to have to decide which side to be on. Um, as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord, and we're going to stick by this King James Bible. I hope you do the same. Thank you for watching.